decrease in temperature for the world is not the only effect of a change in climate. Okay, so this increase in temperature has led to other um, changes for the Earth, such as melting summer Arctic sea ice. Okay, summer Arctic sea ice has declined. There's been good measurements, um, reliable continuous measurements of average monthly uh, Arctic sea ice extent from 1979 to 2015. And September is the month of the year with the lowest sea ice extent. Okay, September's the end of summer. So after se um, September, the ice starts reforming. Okay, it, um, it melts during the summer, reaches a minimum during in September, and then it uh, starts increasing again. Okay. Now this ice reforms um, basically, and by the w winter time in the Arctic, um, the sea ice is covering the Arctic Ocean completely. But in the summer, it's melting. What's happening more and more of it's melting in the summer. Okay, as we go forward in time, when measurements of uh, September Arctic sea ice extent began in 1979, there were about 7.2 million square kilometers. Okay. By 2015, September 2015, there were only 4.6 million square kilometers of sea ice extent or area. Okay. And the blue line here shows the net trend in average September Arctic sea ice extent from 1979 to 2015. You see the decrease, right? And if anything, the decrease has been faster in more recent years. In fact, shouldn't say if anything, it definitely has been. From, you know, from 1979 to 1996, there wasn't a whole lot of net trend in September Arctic Sea Ice Extent. It was pretty flat. In fact, 1996, that year, Clinton versus Dole had, before a lot of you were born, have the uh, highest September sea ice extent, okay, on record going back to 1979. And then look at what's happened to the trend from 1996 to 2015, just in the last 20 years, okay, faster decrease, right? And 2012 had the lowest September sea ice extent, just 3.6 million square kilometers, well under half of what it was 16 years earlier, okay? 2007 had the second lowest sea ice extent of about uh, 4.3 million square kilometers. The 11 um, years with the lowest September sea ice extents have all occurred in the last 11 years. Okay. If the net trend shown in blue um, for the entire period, the net trend for the entire period continues by 2054, there will be ice-free summers in the Arctic. But with a faster decrease in recent years, the Arctic summers could be ice-free by 2040, perhaps even earlier. Okay. There's been climate model runs to try to determine when these summers will be ice-free in the Arctic. And the observations in the past few years have shown that the, uh, the ice is melting faster than the climate model has even thought they, uh, that it would. And there's all types of impacts to this, right? The polar bears rely heavily on the sea ice in order to hunt for seals, okay? And with more sea ice melting, they have to swim farther distances. They have less access to locations to hunt seals, and they're not very aquatic, right? So they're not meant to swim very long distances. Um, and also... The, the polar regions are warming up faster. Remember how from 1915 to 2015, global average temperature increased 1.75 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, for the Arctic, it increased more like 4 or 5 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Because the sea ice is very reflective. Sea ice reflects about uh, 85 to 90% of incoming sunlight. And when it melts, dark open ocean is exposed, which absorbs 85 to 90% of incoming sunlight, okay? There's an, a feedback, it's a positive feedback loop, where the ice melts, okay, because of the warming. Albedo therefore decreases absorbed as the dark op op open ocean is exposed, so absorption of sunlight increases, which causes a further warming, which causes more ice to melt, and so on. You get the idea. Okay. 
There's also um, changes to the jet stream. The um, Arctic is, and also the Antarctic, but more so the Arctic, more dramatically, Arctic are, is, are warming up faster than the rest of the world. And what causes the jet stream is a difference in temperature between the um, the tropics and the poles, okay? And that difference in temperature from the equatorial regions and the high latitudes is decreasing as the poles warm up faster. And so the jet stream could slow down. Perhaps storms will be slower moving because uh, storms in the mid-latitudes follow the jet stream, right? That's what helps uh, steer them, okay? And uh, determines how fast they'll move. And also the jet stream might be shifting north, it turns out, which could leave California drier. Parts of California that aren't desert already could be desert by uh, 2000, by 2100, okay? Or sooner, even, much sooner. Here's a uh, figure showing what the um, extent of the sea ice was in the Arctic at the end of summer in September, that is, of 1979, okay? You see it covering most of the Arctic, okay? Here's Greenland, okay? Um, here's northern Canada, right? Here's Alaska, here's Russia. And then look at what the sea ice extent was as viewed from above in 2007, which, by the way, wasn't even the lowest year of sea ice extent. Dramatic reduction, right? You get the idea. Okay. Also, new shipping channels could open up, right? Now you'll be able to sail from Europe to Asia, right? Or North America to Europe, okay? Um, or North America to Asia, I should say. Okay, You can sail from North America to parts of Europe already if you go east, right? Uh, south of Greenland. Sea levels going up. One common misconception is that the melting of the Arctic sea ice is causing sea level to go up. But the two main causes of sea level increase are actually melting of continental ice, not the sea ice, but the continental ice, such as over Greenland, as you saw on the previous figure. And you know where the largest continental ice sheet is in the world? It's over Antarctica. Okay. So the ice melts along the edges of Antarctica, Greenland, and then it flows into the oceans, okay, and uh, increases the height of the ocean. Okay? The sea ice is responsible for a very small amount of um, sea ice melting. is responsible for a small amount of sea level rise because it's kind of like an ice cube in a um, glass of water. With ice cube melt, the level of the water doesn't increase that much. But another cause of sea level rise is thermal expansion. The oceans are warming up. Remember, we talked about global average temperature increasing. Well, 70% of the globe is covered by ocean. So the ocean warms up. Molecules move faster. Remember, they have more kinetic energy. And they spread out. Okay, and so the ocean expands vertically. This figure shows how sea level has changed from 1880 to um, just past 2000. Okay. Using tidal gauge records. For most of the period, and then more recently, satellite measurements as technology has improved, and you see the increase. In fact, from 1900 to 2000, so over the 20th century, global sea level rose 20 centimeters, or for us Americans, um, about 7.87 inches. Okay, that's about eight to divide by 12 is two thirds, so about two thirds of a foot. Okay, doesn't sound like a whole lot, right? Oh, sea level went up two thirds of a foot from 2000, uh, 1900 to 2000, but that's only the global average sea level increase. You have to remember that the individual, the effects of global warming are going to vary. They can vary greatly depending on where you are. Okay, so that's so. For example, temperature increase could be a lot more in one region of the world than another. Sea level increase could be more in one region of the world than another. It depends on all types of factors. Like for the sea level increase, the currents, the geography, okay, the location, how, right, how much warming it's going to experience. Um, pro uh, proximity to ice sheets melting, okay, and uh, in the 21st century, the sea level rise is only only going to be much more dramatic. 
you know, a few years ago that the range for sea level rise in the 21st century um, was two to four feet. Okay, that was a very agreed upon uh, range, okay, by a large majority of climate scientists. Today it's three to six feet because the ice sheets are melting faster, okay? So think about that. In the 20th century, sea, the global sea level goes up by two thirds of a foot. And now in the 21st century, global sea level is going to go up three to six feet. Okay, so you notice a dramatic increase. And so if anything, some of the effects of global warming that already have occurred, they're just going to intensify. Remember how in the 100 year period from 1915 to 2015, global average temperature went up 1.75 degrees Fahrenheit? You know how much it's gonna go up in the 21st century? The likely range um, is about three to seven Fahrenheit. Okay, so more, okay. But not trying to depress you, there's been a great increase in the amount of electricity generated from renewable sources in recent years. We'll talk about this ways to mitigate against global warming, okay? And the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, as we'll discuss more, is electricity generation. And the world is changing in how it generates electricity, okay? We'll talk about this. So, what's causing this warming? CO2 concentrations are going up. CO2 carbon dioxide is the most abundant anthropogenic greenhouse gas. It's at unprecedented levels. Okay? You'll remember this figure from um, the first lecture and the first chapter in the book, the Keeling Curve. Since 1958, there have been continuous measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration at the Mauna Loa Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii. And when the observations began, the CO2 concentration was at 315 parts per million or 0.0315% of dry air by volume. Now, in 2016, it's above 400 parts per million, okay? It keeps going up. Now, the blue shows the net trend. The gray shows the, the um, observations based on monthly measurements. And do you know what causes this wobbling? It's a seasonal cycle because of photosynthesis and respiration and how they uh, vary over the course of a year, okay, and photosynthesis is when plants use carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight energy to make carbohydrate or glucose for their nourishment, okay. Respiration is when the plants decay and release carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, okay. So, CO2 concentrations go down in the spring and summertime, then they go up in the fall and winter time. But despite the yearly trend, the net trend over several years is obviously very clear, okay? And going back further in time, you see that CO2 concentrations have gone up even more than uh, about, what is that, 400 minus 315, 85 parts per million in the last um, 58 years, okay? In, you know, were there one or two industrial revolutions? Was, or should I say, was there one or were there two industrial revolutions? It depends on what historian you talk to, right? Either there was one in the mid-1700s, another in the mid-1800s. Um, so there were two, or there was one long one. Regardless, the end of the last one was in the mid-1800s. And then, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere were about 280 parts per million. Today, they're above 400 parts per million. Okay. Going back further in time, just trying to illustrate to you that CO2 concentrations are at just unprecedented levels. This figure uses the Mauna Loa data since 1958 and ice core data before that. Okay, There's trapped air bubbles in the ice and you can uh, measure CO2 co chemical compositions in the uh, ice core, such as CO2 concentration. Okay? And what you see is that going back 800,000 years before the uh, 1900s, CO2 concentration was never above 300 parts per million, okay? It varied between 180 and 300 parts per million. When it was very low for a long period of time, there were ice ages. When it was higher, there were warm periods, okay? If you looked at um, the correlation between CO2 concentration going back 800,000 years and temperature, you'd see a very um, strong connection, okay? And so now you see the dramatic spike, right? It looks like a vertical asymptote, right, from algebra. 
in CO2 concentrations in the past, just the past several decades, okay, and you see it show up if you go back hundreds of thousands of years. Dramatic, right? What's causing that? You know, CO2 concentration is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It And CO2 has a long atmospheric lifetime. It stays in the atmosphere about 120 years on average, okay? There's one person still alive in the world born in the 1800s. Um, this Italian lady, right, she just turned... Uh, 117, okay, she was born in 1899, okay, and, um, global carbon dioxide emissions have increased tremendously over the past 150 years, even just the past 65, 66 years. As a personal example, my dad was born in 1950, okay, and then the world was putting 5,000 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, okay. Remember, a ton, well, an English ton is 2,000 pounds, okay, it's a lot. Metric ton is not quite, but close to that. So this is a lot of carbon dioxide being put in the atmosphere, okay. We'll talk about the sources, okay. And then, as of now, about 35,000 millimetric tons of carbon dioxide are being put in the atmosphere. That's an increase of seven over uh, my dad's lifetime, okay. So you see... Atmospheric CO2 emissions, the amount being put in the atmosphere by the world, by the global emissions, is slowly increasing in the late 1800s, and then it really starts increasing faster in the second half of the 20th century, okay, into the early part of the 21st century. Now, this is just a projection here in red, but look at that. You see that slight pause or, um, right, that horizontal line there at the end of the uh, blue curve, okay? It's possible that global carbon dioxide emissions could be peaking, okay? Now we're gonna, you know, because you see how for a few years it might go down or up and then it starts increasing again. We're gonna have to wait to see if this is kind of a change in the pattern, okay? But like I've been telling you, there's been a tremendous increase in the amount of renewable energy sources for electricity generation. We're changing the way we get energy for transportation, okay? We're making more energy efficient homes and businesses, okay? People are more conscious of the environment. This figure just shows the um, relationship between CO2 concentration in the atmosphere at the top and temperature at the bottom. Very strong correlation. Okay? So not surprisingly, since we've had such a dramatic spike in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations um, since the early to mid-1900s, that's why temperatures have spiked, like you saw on the hockey stick diet thing, right, when we compare it to going back hundreds of years, okay. Carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas, it's the most abundant anthropogenic one, and most of the world's greenhouse gases come from carbon dioxide, which is what I talk about a lot, but methane concentrations have increased too, okay, so have nitrous oxide concentrations. Methane is CH4, some of its primary sources include landfills, burning of natural gas, natural gas is 79% methane, extraction of natural gas, transport of natural gas, natural gas can be used as an alternative to petroleum for transportation, highway 17 bus, right, clean air bus powered by natural gas, look at the top of it, okay, LA used to be smell -A, but now LA has changed, they introduced their first natural gas bus in 1995. They retired their last diesel bus in 2011. LA used to always use diesel buses. And now they use natural gas buses. And the air is cleaner. Natural gas emits about 80 to 90% less aerosols to generate the same amount of energy for transportation compared to products made from oil like diesel and gasoline. Natural gas is also slightly cleaner in that it emits less greenhouse gases. But it's not the long-term answer um, for transportation or power generation. We'll talk about the um, U.S. is shifting to natural gas instead of coal. It's cleaner, but it's still a fossil fuel. Okay? Methane can also come from uh, livestock. Cows, moo, sheep, bat, goats, scream. Okay? Fox, what the fox say? Then nitrous oxide is also known as laughing gas. It can come from uh, agriculture, not the, the animals, but the pesticide use, the fertilization, the irrigation for crops. 
the two countries that emit the most carbon dioxide are China and U.S. U.S. used to be the leader. In 2006, China overtook the U.S. as the world's top emitting country for carbon dioxide. Now, the U.S. is still much higher in emissions per person. China has a population of about 1.3 billion. 1.4 billion. It's getting close to me. And the China emits twice as much carbon dioxide as the U.S. Okay. But China has four times the population as the U.S. Okay. So, in fact, average American emits about twice as much carbon dioxide per year as the average Chinese person. But you see that the dramatic spike in China's CO2 emissions during the 2000s. In 2000, China was emitting 3,500 millimetric tons of carbon dioxide per year. By 2010, they were up to near 10,000 millimetric tons of carbon dioxide per year. That's almost an increase by a factor of three. Their CO2 emissions for the country tripled in about 10 years. Okay? Crazy. But it's because their economy and population was rapidly developing. Well, their economy and their, was rapidly developing. Their emissions were greatly increasing. The population is spiking. But they're changing. Not making this up. Just in the past few years, China has deployed a lot of new renewable sources for power generation. You know, in the 2000s, they were building a lot of new coal power plants, and so their emissions were going up. But in 2014, late 2014, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, had a meeting with Obama, and China agreed to peak their carbon dioxide emissions by 2030, okay? So by 2030, in fact, it could be much sooner than that now with the way they're going. They're going to reach a maximum of emissions of carbon dioxide and then they'll start to decline, okay? In fact, from 2014 to 2030, in that 16-year period, China's going to have to deploy enough um, uh, new electricity generation from zero emission sources such as renewable, solar, wind, hydroelectric, and nuclear than all the electricity they generate from coal today, which is amazing. Okay, so they're changing you guys. Okay. Now, carbon dioxide is the most important anthropogenic greenhouse gas. It has the highest concentration, has a long lifetime, and for these different reasons, it has the largest impact on climate of all greenhouse gases. Methane, a single molecule of methane has 25 the war times the warm warming effect of a single molecule of carbon dioxide. So, one molecule of methane, CH4, is equivalent to 25 molecules of carbon dioxide, CO2. Thankfully, there's a, so much less methane in the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide concentrations are above 400 parts per million now in the atmosphere. Methane concentrations are only 2 parts per million. Okay? And also, while CO2 lasts in the atmosphere, on average 120 years, could be less, could be more, um, methane only lasts about 12 years. Okay? If, if methane concentrations were anywhere near what CO2 concentrations are today, the world would have a lot more issues. Okay? Because methane is a stronger greenhouse gas on a molecular basis, but because there's so much less of it in the atmosphere, there's about 0.5% of, of, of the amount of methane in the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide, and it lasts much shorter, okay, then um, carbon dioxide has a much greater total net effect, right, uh, on global warming. Now again, a strong greenhouse effect means more of Earth's outgoing infrared radiation trap the warmer temperature. In the absence of the greenhouse effect, Earth's average surface temperature would be minus 18 Celsius. Degrees Celsius, or for us Americans, zero degrees Fahrenheit. Although, you know, the U.S. is only one of three countries in the world, out of how many countries are in the world now? 200 plus, 300? Only one of three that still uses the English system as their official system of measurement. Okay. The other two are um, Burma, or Myanmar in Southeast Asia near Thailand, and uh, Liberia in Northwest Africa. Okay. But everywhere else uses the metric system. So, you know, there's a lot of um, international students at San Jose State. Um, 
really like teaching there because you know there's people from all over. You get to learn about different cultures. Okay, it's very interesting. And uh, for a lot, of, so what I'm saying is, for some of you, you might be more familiar with degrees Celsius. Okay, depends what you've grown up with. Okay. So, with no greenhouse effect, most of the solar energy would reach the surface. And the Earth releases outgoing infrared energy at longer wavelengths, but that outgoing infrared radiation would leave. It wouldn't come back. But with the greenhouse effect, some, in fact, most of that outgoing infrared radiation gets absorbed before it leaves the atmosphere. And then this figure isn't showing it, but it gets re-emitted back to the surface. And this greenhouse effect keeps the Earth at a comfortable average temperature of average surface temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Although this is the average basically for the um, last 100, 150 years. Now Earth's average surface temperature is more like 60, 61 Fahrenheit. Okay. By 2100, worst case scenario, it could be approaching 70 Fahrenheit. But best case scenario, it might stabilize in the low to mid 60s. So there's obviously a relationship between energy usage and global warming because for decades, energy generation in the U.S., along with a lot of countries, has mainly relied on the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, crude oil is known as petroleum. There's other types of oil, but most of the energy from oil is from, from this type. And then there's natural gas, the cleanest, cleanest fossil fuel, but it's still not really clean cleaner, but not clean. Now, when you burn the fossil fuels to get energy, it, it emits greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and this plays a role in climate change. Okay. Another thing about these fossil fuels are that they exist in finite supplies. The world only has about 30 to 35 years of oil left if current usage rates continue. And that should strike you, because so much of what we use every day is made from oil. Okay. Plastics, basketballs, toothpaste, perfume, okay, stereos. And, then, and for transportation, about 95% of the energy for transportation in the world comes from products made from oil, like gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. Okay. So we are living in an interesting time. There's... there's uh, We'll have coal and natural gas lasting for longer times, but they're still finite resources. They're not naturally replenished over time. They're not renewable. So, it's important to reduce energy usage, okay, to reduce usage of fossil fuels to help conserve them and save the planet. There's multiple reasons to reduce energy usage. One, you're helping uh, make these finite supplies last longer. Okay, so we'll have more time to transition to renewable sources and alternative sources. And two, you're helping the planet. Okay. And also you can feel good about yourself and post on Facebook. Okay. Look onto alternative energy sources. So then we can talk about the different sources of greenhouse gas emissions for U.S. Okay, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by sector in 2014 is shown here. And what you see is that the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. as of 2014, still today, it's electricity generation, making up three-tenths of all greenhouse gas emissions. It takes energy to turn the power on, okay? And um, for decades... The top source of power generation in America was coal, but it's changing, okay? Um, we'll talk about that. Transportation is the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, 26%. Okay, so electricity and transportation together make up over half of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Industry is third at 21% of greenhouse gas emissions, about a fifth. Okay, what's industry? Factories, right? Trump made in America. Okay. Commercial and residential usage. Using energy at business and home. How you dispose of waste. Okay. How you heat your home. 
okay, it affects um, emissions, and that can be different from, you know, generating electricity at your, for your home, which is shown by that big slice, okay, of the dark blue. And then agriculture as emissions, we talked about that. Not only the livestock, but also the, what's needed to be done to the crops to make them grow. And then we can talk about U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by type, and this is what I was talking about earlier. Most of the U greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. come from carbon dioxide. In fact, as of 2014, more than four-fifths, 81% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are from carbon dioxide. There's a reason it's the most abundant greenhouse gas. Anthropogenic greenhouse gas. Water va vapor is a greenhouse gas, but it's highly variable. It only lasts in the atmosphere for an order of 9 to 10 days, unlike these other greenhouse gases, which last decades to centuries. Water vapor is not itself responsible for global warming, owing to its short lifetime and great variability. It's highly variable, unlike the other greenhouse gases. It makes up more from 0 to 5% of atmospheric volume, constant composition, depending on temperature even. Remember how warmer air is capable of holding more water vapor? But it can... Um, alter the pace of change. There's a water vapor feedback where if the earth warms up because of more anthropogenic greenhouse gases, you get more evaporation off the oceans, therefore atmospheric water vapor content increases, which can strengthen the greenhouse effect and reinforce the initial change in warming. So actually, water vapor can increase the climate sensitivity. So because of water vapor, the it can itself cause global warming, but it could increase the amount of global warming um, from the initial reason, the uh, increase in greenhouse gases from anthropogenic sources. 11% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2014 were from methane. So together, carbon dioxide and methane, which are both made of carbon, make up 92% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Nitrous oxide is laughing gas. Fluorinated gases um, can sometimes be replacements for CFCs, which were depleting the ozone. Okay. Then we could talk about where the electricity comes from. It's important to know where U.S. electricity comes from because it's the largest source of emissions. Well, 2015 was a landmark year for U.S. power generation because for the first time, um, Basically, in, in forever, in terms of how, in, how long we've been able to generate electricity in the U.S., coal was not alone the number one source for a year of electricity generation. Coal generates, still generates 33%, a third of U.S. power, but natural gas caught up to coal. Okay? In 2013, coal was responsible for 39% of U.S. power generation, and natural gas was second at 27%. Okay, of U.S. power generation. But now, because of all of the increase in new electricity generated from natural gas, okay, the fact that the U.S. is starting to rely on it more, natural gas, there's as much electricity generated in the U.S. now from coal as natural gas. Or I should say natural gas is coal. Although, this could change, okay, because Trump is a big proponent of coal. He wants to bring back coal, okay, have more coal mines. Um, he's, um, you should, I should show a picture where him is holding a sign that says Trump thinks coal. And so maybe coal will resurge. Okay, we'll see right, what happens in the next few years. It'll be an interesting time. Then nuclear is the third largest source of electricity generation in the U.S., about a fifth. Now the thing with coal, why were we getting away from it? Okay, why was, were we starting to have more... Um, well, it was decreasing in the share of U.S. electricity generation because one natural gas is starting to replace it. And why? And also we're generating a lot more electricity from renewables. Why? Because coal has the greatest greenhouse gas emissions and aerosol release per unit electricity generated of any source. It's basically the dirtiest. To be blunt, it's the dirtiest, right? And it's the most polluting. Uh, to generate a certain, you know, a, a unit of electricity of all these sources. Then why 
for decades was it the top source of electricity generation in the U.S.? And why is it the top source of power generation for the world? And it's been like that for decades, hundred, maybe more than a hundred years. Why? What makes, determines decisions we make in life? Money. It's cheap. It's inexpensive. Uh, coal is. Natural gas is often several times more expensive, although it's become cheaper in recent years, which has led to its uh, surge. And um, the coal power plants are, are pretty inexpensive to operate and maintain. They also don't cost much to build. Okay. Are you learning? We have some renewable sources here. The largest renewable source for power generation in America is hydroelectric. You see that as dams. The spinning, the moving water turns a turbine which is connected to a generator. Dams can also serve for flood control and irrigation and urban water supplies. Wind is now making up near about 5% of U.S. electricity generation. And that's up from um, a half a percent um, less than 10 years ago. Okay, Still, the U.S. doesn't get a whole lot of power from solar or geothermal, although these are expanding in certain states we'll talk about. Okay. You can also get electricity from biomass, okay. plant material, crop material. While petroleum is the dominant source for transportation energy, very little electricity is generated from petroleum in America. So to help summarize, the largest, the three largest energy sources for power generation in the U.S. in 2015 were coal and natural gas, tied at 33%, nuclear at 20%. Now fossil fuels still make up two-thirds of power generation in the U.S. because Coal and natural gas make up 66%, almost two-thirds, of U.S. power generation, and petroleum makes up 0.7%. Renewable resources make up 13.3%, getting close to a seventh of uh, U.S. power generation, and this is up from 10% in 2006. And if you looked at the actual amount of electricity generated from renewables and how it's changed in the past few years, you'd see a b bigger increase because the amount of electricity in the U.S. Um, electricity generation in the U.S. has increased too. So while the percentage has increased 3.3%, the actual amount of um, electricity generated, the amount has increased more. Okay. Now California is the golden state but also the green state. We generate a much greater share of our electricity from renewables. We also rely much less on coal than for the U.S. as a whole. That rhymes. By the way, that's another uh, issue um, you can talk about. But even though uh, Trump might be pushing for coal, want to pull out of the Paris Agreement, you gotta remember that states have their own emission standards, okay? The right does the president make all the decisions in the U.S. Natural gas makes up sixty percent of California's electricity generation. It's by far the dominant source of power generation in Cali. Coal basically is used to generate no electricity in California, okay? But you see, these renewables here have larger percentages than for the U.S. If this is a pie, you could see the slices, right, are bigger, okay? Examples, hydroelectric makes up 7% of California's electricity compared to 6% for the U.S. Wind makes up 6% uh, of California's electricity generation compared to about 5% for the U.S. Bigger differences for geothermal makes up 6% of California's electricity generation compared to 0.4% for the U.S. and solar. Did you know that in 2015, solar replaced hydroelectric as the top renewable source for power generation in California? It's blowing up so fast here. For decades, hydroelectric was the top renewable source for power generation in California. Now, solar has replaced it. Oh, well, Less than 1% of U.S. power comes from solar. It's up to about 1% for the world. Almost 8%. We're getting close to 8% of 
of California's power comes from solar. From 2011 to 2015, the amount of electricity generated from solar here in California increased by a factor of 12. And from solar panels alone, more than 60. You can also generate solar from what's called thermal power plants, where you have a bunch of mirrors or lenses or reflectors concentrated on a tower with a fluid. All that concentrated sunlight heats the fluid, turns a turbine, connected to a generator, makes electricity. Okay, and that can be transformed. Or you can have panels on their own home, generate the electricity right there using the photovoltaic effect, where you convert sun's energy into um, electricity. Some conclusions someone can draw based on this figure is that the largest source for power generation in California is natural gas. The second largest source is nuclear. makes up about 10% of our power. There's one operating power, nuclear power plant in California. It is the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, uh, basically close to Avia Beach, near San Luis Obispo, a few hours south of um, San Jose. There was a nuclear power plant operating near San Diego, but it closed down in 2013. Um, nuclear power is actually, in a way, it's clean. It just, nuclear power plants do not emit any greenhouse gases or aerosols directly. Okay? And the probability of accidents is very small. Okay? But there have been a few that makes the public uneasy. And there's also nuclear waste generated each year, which takes a long time to decay. Okay, so there's an issue of where do you store that nuclear waste so it doesn't get near people and cause health effects. Solar is now the third largest source for power generation in California. Hydroelectric is fourth. Much less reliance on coal than the U.S. for as a whole. Now, 60% of California's electricity generation does come from fossil fuels, 60.3%, but it's all natural gas, okay? 0.3% of California's power comes from coal. 0% comes from petroleum, okay? And natural gas is the cleanest fossil fuel for electricity and transportation generation. Now, this sounds good, right? More than 30% of California's electricity comes from renewable sources compared to 13.3% for the U.S., okay? More than twice as much electricity, or, well, not net electricity, but the share, the percentage of electricity in California that comes from renewables is more than twice as great as the share or percentage for the U.S., okay? The green state. I think this sounds good, because California is the most populous state in the Union, Right? There's a saying as California goes, so goes the nation, and almost a third of our power comes from renewables. Other states can look at California as a leader. Now we're going to start talking about using energy at home, how you can, where uh, it comes from, how you can save it. How about the sources of household energy usage? Here's um, a figure showing energy consumption in American homes. In 93, 1993, and quadrillion British thermal units, and also percentages compared to 2009. The actual energy consumption in homes did not change a whole lot. This is for um, America, okay? But the shares did. In, in 1993, over half of the elect uh, energy used in an American home was to space heating. Okay, heating your home, right? In 2009, that value was down to 41.5%. If you look at space heating and water heating, okay? You heat the water for a nice shower, for your to do laundry, okay? Uh, in 1993, 71 0.4% of energy usage in American homes was space and water heating, okay? Over two-thirds. In 2009, um, it was about um, space and water heating made up 59.2%, um, okay, of uh, 
energy usage in America. I'm still over half, okay? So you get the idea, okay? It takes a lot of energy. That's where a lot of the energy usage comes from, right? Heating your home. It's the air and the water. Now, what you see a change, you see a big change in um, the amount of uh, percentage of uh, household energy usage from appliances, dishwasher, washing machine, okay, fridge, electronics, TV, computer, radio, and lighting. In 93, less than a quarter of household energy usage came from appliances, electronics, and lighting. Again, this is for America. But by 2009, more than a third of household energy usage came from appliances, electronics, and lighting. Okay? What changed? Well, you can think about it and know that in 1993, you know, very few, basically very few people had a computer, right? The internet wasn't even around. Very few people had a computer at home, okay? Uh, some people didn't have a TV, they had a small one, okay? And so, and, um, you know, what's changed? More computers, okay? Now, energy is equal to power multiplied by time. It takes power to turn something on. And the longer something is on, the more energy used. If something is not on, I mean, if something takes power but it's not used for any time, right, energy usage is zero. Okay. Now, what is power measuring? Ever look at the fine print on, oh, your charger, your electric heater, your fridge? It's, it can be measured in watts or kilowatts. One kilowatt is a thousand watts. Okay, kilo means thousand. On your PG&E bill, total electricity usage is given in kilowatt hours, which is equal to one kilowatt multiplied by one hour. If you had a small portable heater on high setting for two hours, and say it uses one kilowatt, one thousand watts of power, it would use two kilowatt hours. Now PG&E charges you per kilowatt hour of electricity used. And they charge you a, um, generally a constant rate until you start exceeding what should satisfy your electricity usage demands. PG&E has these rates based on a tier structure. The baseline is the amount of energy intended to satisfy an average customer's electricity needs in a given area. Basically, um, PG&E billing cycle lasts for a month, and you're not supposed to exceed this baseline amount. This baseline amount should be enough electricity. It's energy, but it's electricity shown here, because kilowatt hours is what the units of electricity for PG&E are. The natural gas usage is in thermos. By the way, now, yeah, electricity comes from natural gas, right? It's made from natural gas, but it's not natural gas itself. But you do use natural gas in your home, for, for the furnace, for the water heater, okay? And that's measured in thermos. But you might not. A few people don't use natural gas, it's fine. You have electric heater, electric um, furnace, water heater. Stove uses natural gas. Oven uses natural gas, but some people have electric stoves and ovens, right? Okay. Now these rates are a few years old. And the exact rates depend on different factors, like where you live, your income, okay? Your marital status, okay? Interesting. But up to the baseline, PG&E will charge you around 13 cents per kilowatt hour. For every kilowatt hour of electricity use costs you 13 cents. But then, once you start exceeding the baseline amount, so you go above what you should be using in terms of electricity, your rate increases from 13 to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, not too much, right? Um, up to about thir to 30 percent more than the baseline amount. But then if you go more than 30% above your the baseline amount, your PG&E rate doubles to 30 cents per kilowatt hour, okay? The reason for this tier structure is to encourage um, customers not to, you know, to conserve energy and not to use too much. If you use more than you should be using, your rate goes up. Now, how much electricity is used per day by Americans? In 2015... The average yearly electricity consumption by a residential customer in America was 10,812 kilowatt hours. If 
A few of you live out of house, so you all have your own PG&E accounts? No. Okay. So this is the average yearly electricity consumption by a residential customer. And that's basically a household. Okay. Some people live alone in studios. There are also houses with 10 to 15 people. Okay. Household size is going to dramatically in, uh, affect your electricity use. Now, if you take this 10,000 kilowatt hours of electricity usage, divided by 365 days, you'd find that daily average electricity usage by an American is 30 kilowatt hours. Okay? But that depends on where you are. You know what it is for Santa Clara County? 18 kilowatt hours. 40% less than for the average American. Average electricity usage um, varies by state. The state with the highest daily average electricity usage over the course of a year is Louisiana. Hey, that's one of the hot, most hot, you know, hottest and humidest states, right? Lowest is actually Hawaii, okay? Maybe it's nice year round. Um, you don't, you know, it's not too hot and humid. The around, um, it's nice. People there are environmentally conscious. Okay. Now, let's talk about light bulbs. What is this ancient contraption on the left? It's an incandescent light bulb. Edison is commonly credited with the invention of it, although he had some help from others. Okay. It works by a tungsten filament being heated and that heat generates light okay what is the instrument on the right it's a cfl or compact fluorescent light bulb it's designed as a replacement for the incandescent light bulb now how it works is um energy is released um, mercury uh, vapor is released, okay? And a phosphor is designed to convert the uh, um, UV light, UV into uh, radiation. Okay? The energy is released, mercury gets excited, emits UV, and then the ultraviolet, which humans can't see, but a phosphor converts the ultraviolet radiation into visible light. Now, the CFL, or compact fluorescent light bulbs, are much more energy efficient than the incandescent light bulbs. You know what percentage of energy used by an incandescent light bulb actually goes into producing light? Only 5 to 10 percent, depending on the model. That means 90 to 95, actually 90 to 95 percent of the energy used by an incandescent light bulb is actually heat. It's like a little heater. There's a reason that if you touch it, it's hot, especially if it's been on a while. Whereas the compact fluorescent light bulbs generally use almost all their energy to produce light and not heat up, okay? The compact fluorescent light bulbs have decreased in cost over the recent years. And they're constantly being improved. The technology is getting better, okay? Some drawbacks to them were that they were more expensive, okay, a few years ago. Um, they didn't work as well with dimmers, okay, I can relate a few years ago in my house, we replaced the, uh, lights above the, um, dining room area with, from incandescent to compact fluorescent, we had a dimmer switch, but it doesn't really work, it's either zero or 100%, it's either off or on, okay, they might not work as well with timers or motion sensors, you know how sometimes people have lights outside that turn on, outside their house, turn on at night when, uh, motion is detected? Compact fluorescent light bulbs might not do that, okay? But they're being improved. Now, they are more energy efficient. Most of the incandescent light bulbs are 40 to 100 watts. There's some with higher wattages, but most of the standard ones you have are 40 to 100 watts. 40 watts is pretty dim. That's good for a romantic evening, okay? 100 watts is bright. Okay, that almost might be too bright, okay? Some people like 75 watts more, okay? If they want nice bright for reading and studying and working and being happy, okay? It's good to have light to be happy, okay? CFL light bulbs use up to 75% less energy and last up to 10 times longer. 
How long does the average incandescent light bulb last? Depends how long you, much you have it on, right? But it can last perhaps anywhere from how, a few months to a few years. Whereas the CFL light bulbs can last for 10, uh, um, 10 20, 30 years, okay? Not cute. So they save you money in the long run for multiple reasons. You don't have to buy the light bulb as much, right? So you save money there, and then they're using less energy. If the se if you have a 40 watts incandescent light bulb compared to a CFL light bulb of 10 watts, okay, which needs a, just a fourth of the power to produce the same luminance, brightness, you're going to save a lot of money, okay? You, the cost is going to be a quarter, right, on your energy bill, and then you won't have to buy it as much, so you save money there, okay? Then you have more money to go to concerts and the club, okay, and eat. It's good to eat. The incandescent light bulbs are being phased out, and actually, they're no longer produced in America, and they're also no longer imported into the U.S. January 2012, the 100-watt light bulbs were banned from being produced or imported here. 2000, January 2013, the 75-watt light bulbs were banned from production and importation. Now, even the 40 and 60-watt dimmer bulbs are being banned. So you notice that the more um, bigger energy consumer bulbs were banned first, right? Now, can you still buy the incandescent light bulbs in America? Yeah. There was a lot of light bulbs made. So there's some still on sale at, you know, Target, Walmart, online, but they're no longer being made here, except maybe on the black market, okay? Um, so, CFL light bulbs are replacing incandescent light bulbs. Also an issue with CFL light bulbs is that they can contain mercury, okay? So they break, they could um, release mercury, okay? There's other replacements for incandescent light bulbs. Halogen light bulbs, look very similar to incandescent light bulbs, but they use uh, less energy. Okay. There's also LED bulbs. Those are really good too. Okay. Now, what are some reasons to reduce energy usage? This leads into the Green Ninja Project. Okay. There's, there's many. Okay. One, reduce use of fossil fuels. It takes fossil fuels to produce energy. And if you use less energy, you're going to be burning less fossil fuels. Remember, fossil fuels exist in finite supplies. They're going to run out eventually. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Burning of fossil fuels from energy generation puts greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And you know what? To stabilize CO2 concentrations, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations at 550 parts per million after the year 2100, Global CO2 emissions have to be cut in half by then, with more decrease after. So remember how from 1950 to now, global CO2 emissions have increased by a factor of siete. Well, they have to be cut in half in the next 85 years, okay? That's the best case scenario that CO2 concentrations stabilize at 550 parts per million after 2100. The worst case scenario is that CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere reach 1,000 parts per million in 2100, two and a half times what they are now. And then what you can think about is that if the atmospheric CO2 concentrations went up 100, 120 parts per million in the past 100, 150 years, and global average temperatures went up a couple of Fahrenheit or so, imagine what an increase of 600 parts per million atmospheric CO2 concentration due to global average temperatures. You also can improve air quality if you use less energy because bur burning of coal and natural gas in power plants, burning of products made in, from oil to release exhaust fumes, not only puts greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but it also puts aerosols in the atmosphere. highly polluted atmosphere can cause health effects. Water in the eyes, um, trouble breathing, especially to those um, sensitive, right, people with asthma, okay? It also doesn't look pretty, right? What looks prettier, blue sky or brown sky? Now, you can reduce reliance on foreign oil. Um, 
including from countries that might like America, might not like America, okay? And you can save money. Maybe this is the most appealing reason for you to save energy, right? Save money, okay? Save cash. Now, here are some ideas to reduce residential energy usage. This is just a laundry list, pun intended, as you'll see um, later. There's so many ways. You can think of some when you think about each room. Think of all the different electronics, appliances that use energy, right? You can think of lots of ways. You can go on the pg and &E website on your account and look at ways to save. There's dozens of ways, okay? But there's just a few, okay? Wear layers to use less space heating. If it's cold at night, instead of turning on the heat, you can wear layers, okay? You can wear a hoodie to bread, bed. You can wear sweatpants, okay? My housemate wears several layers, okay? You can turn off the lights when leaving the room. Sounds so simple, right? And yet people still forget, okay? They'll come in, they'll turn the light on, and then they'll leave without food. Or, so you just have to get, you know, with some of these, you just have to get in the habit of doing it, right? Once you get in the habit of doing something, it's like second nature, okay? But maybe you already do this, okay? Switch to environmentally friendly light bulbs. If you have incandescent light bulbs still in your house, switch to CFLs, okay? Switch to halogen, switch to LED, okay? You'll save money. You'll save energy. It... You can unplug the extra refrigerator in the garage. Some people may have a very large refrigerator in the garage with almost nothing in it. And that refrigerator, refrigerator can use a lot of energy. And so what you could do is take out what's in that fridge in the garage and then put it in the fridge in the kitchen and turn off, unplug the uh, fridge in the garage. You can substitute an air conditioner with fan and open windows. You can also allow clothes to dry outside or in a warmer region of your home, like the garage. Okay. Um, um, my housemate helped me learn to do this more. Towels take a long time to dry. If you have a few towels in with your other clothes, like your shirts, Pants, okay. It, the towels might really uh, increase the time of drying, so you could put them, especially in the summertime when the garage gets hot, you could put them there, okay. Or yard, you know, you can put them on the clothesline in the sun, and they'll dry so fast, right? The sun is so powerful. But, um, now, what is going on here? We have some wind turbines, okay. Some countries rely more on renewable sources of power generation than others. In Denmark, there's been a large increase in the share of electricity generation from wind. In 2013, 28% of electricity in Denmark came from wind. In 2014, it was up to 39%. Now, about close to half of Denmark's electricity comes from wind. This is a solar power tower. This is what I was telling you about earlier. Look at all these mirrors and reflectors, okay? Concentrating all that sunlight. When this tower, where fluid is heated, which turns the turbine, which generates a lot of electricity. Okay. Now, currently, about 20%, one-fifth of the world's power generation comes from renewable energy sources. Okay. But the amount varies greatly depending on country. Okay, Israel generates about 3% of its power from renewables. U.S., as you saw, it's about 13%. But Canada, right? Canada, Drake, Justin Bieber, Justin Trudeau, generates almost two-thirds of their power from renewables. Norway generates 97% of its power from renewables. Read more about the countries and their different uh, percentage generation from renewables for electricity. This article. Okay. If one fifth of the world's power comes from renewables right now, 
what do you think about in 2030? You know what? It might be 25%. That's the, the worst case, the lowest scenario. Um, okay, it's still a court, you know, it's 2030. Still, we have a long way to time to grow. I mean, we need to take action sooner rather than later. Okay, CO2 lasts in the atmosphere. 120 years, right? Okay. But the best case scenario is hopefully this happens because this will really help save the planet. Okay. If, if we only increase to 25% of power generation in the world from renewables by 2030, it's just, it's on the bad, it's on the worst track. Okay. It's on the track to the most one. Okay. But in 2030, just 15, actually like what, 13 or 14 years from now, one fit, one half of the world's power could be from renewables worldwide. This is a dramatic change, okay? For decades, for more than a century, okay, the world has relied on fossil fuels to generate electricity, mainly coal. And now we're saying by 2030, maybe half of the world's power could come from renewables. And if you remember that some of the world's power comes from nuclear, right? That means less than half, okay? Not the same, but more power from renewables than fossil fuel sources. So we'll see what happens. Renewables are blowing up so fast, though, as the technology improves and costs decline, okay? Now, 